Hello, I'm Wolf Blitzer. I'm uh, reporting uh, from the uh, Situation Room. I'm al always in the Situation Room because, as uh, Sandy knows, whatever room I'm in, there's a situation. So this happens to be my Situation Room office right here. Thanks so much to everyone for watching. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm really proud of Sandy Greenberg, who's written a truly amazing, amazing book. Uh, in fact, it's one of the most important and compelling books I've read in a very, very long time. The book, uh, and I'll put it up here, right? You can see it right there. The book is entitled, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, subtitled, How Daring Dreams and Unyielding Friendship Turned One Man's Blindness into an Extraordinary Vision for a Life. Uh, full disclosure, Sandy Greenberg and I are friends, and we're both from Buffalo, New York, where we both grew up, uh, a great city, home of our Buffalo Bills, so we're very proud of that. Uh, so, uh, Sandy, thanks so much for, A, being with us, and thanks so much for writing this really, really terrific book. I couldn't put it down. Every page was so powerful and so significant, so important. Uh, you've got a great introduction by Art Garfunkel, Forward by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Final Word by Margaret Atwood. Uh, it's really, really a terrific book. Uh, I want to just start off, Sandy, by Thank asking you. you, why did you decide to write this book? In my junior year, I lost my eyesight, as you know from the book. And I then spent the next two years trying to come back to life. And... Uh, I wound up going to graduate school after those two years. And the second day I got to graduate school, I felt it in me to write about the experience I had for the past two years. And I sat down at my Smith Corona typewriter. I typed for 40 pages. I finished. I put them away for 40 years. And during those intervening decades, I had plenty of time to think about what has happened and where I want to go and the state of the world. Uh, and when I was ready, which was the beginning of this century, I picked it up again and completed the book. Really an amazing story. Uh, and uh, I know I want uh, people to read the book, but very briefly, tell us, you were what a sophomore at Columbia University, when all of a sudden uh, you, you had some eye issues, yep. you went back to Buffalo, uh, and what happened? Uh, it was actually at the end of my sophomore year, beginning of my junior year, I was pitching in a baseball game. And in the seventh inning, my eyes became quite cloudy and uh, steamy. And I almost hit the batter. So I knew that uh, things were not good. And I stumbled off the mound to the sidelines. And it turns out that my girlfriend, Sue, happened to be there. and. Uh, when I was on the ground, she lifted my head up and put it on her lap and asked me what had happened. And I told her simply, I don't know. I just couldn't see for a while. And that episode passed rather quickly. But then I had recurring episodes. And finally, I went to an ophthalmologist who gave me some medicine that didn't work. He told me that I had an allergic conjunctivitis. Then I was referred to what was what people call the best ophthalmologist in Erie County. And I went to see this man and he essentially misdiagnosed um, my condition, which was glaucoma. He too felt it was an allergic conjunctivitis. And so he gave me topical steroids to use every day, a couple of times a day. And by the end of my junior year, uh, I had lost my eyesight. And, and what is so, so compelling Sandy, is how this was such a horrible situation, but how you overcame it and went on to such great, great, great success. And give our give our uh, people who are watching right now a sense how you did that, because so many people would have just given up and and moved on, but but you refused to accept this, and you did, you you were determined you were going to finish college and go to graduate school and become successful, and you become amazingly successful. How did you do that? That's a very good question. I've asked myself uh, that same question in, in retrospect. Uh, 
I would say in the first instance, it was my girlfriend who really was the centerpiece of this story. She became the center pole of my life. And she had a choice after I lost my eyesight, whether she wanted to continue to stay with me or leave. And she decided to stay with me. She had a choice. I unfortunately did not have a choice. So hers is the greater moral accomplishment, I think. And she has been with me for the past 60 years. And uh, she has been the joy of my life. Uh, somebody asked me once why I stayed with Sue. And I told them that I didn't stay with her because she was my support. I stayed with her because I loved her. And I told the person that that was an affidavit from my heart. And of course, the other person somewhat cynically said, well, what's that self-serving warrant worth? I said everything. And so she has been at the center of my journey and uh, don't believe I could have done it without her. I had my siblings, some of whom you know, uh, who uh, all of us used to have the pleasure of dining at um, Blitzer's Delicatessen uh, when we grew up. And um, they similarly supported me. Uh, and then when I went back to Buffalo after my surgery in Detroit, which was truly the winter of my discontent, my friend, Art Garfunkel, who was my roommate, flew up to Buffalo to tell me that I was going to return to Columbia. And we walked down Saranac Avenue for a good hour, hour and a half. And he tried to persuade me that I had no choice but to come back. And I told him that there was no, I had no ability to come back because I had no resources. And by the way, Arthur, I'm blind. And he said, I, I don't think you understand. He said, no, Sanford. I don't think you understand because he and I, in our sophomore year, uh, before we roomed to, at the beginning of time in which we roomed together, we made a pact. And the pact was simply that if either of us was in crisis, the other would attend to him. And he said, well, th this is that situation, Sanford. I'm here to help you. But I'm also in a bit of a crisis. I need you back at Columbia. You're my best friend, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, then you must come back. But we argued for quite some time and uh, I listened carefully, but frankly wasn't persuaded until the end of our walk when he turned to me and he said, look, We studied the Greeks, and you recall Sophocles, Philoctetes, who had a festering wound and was isolated on an island and couldn't get off. But the gods gave him special armamentarium to fight with. And through Odysseus, he was asked to go back and conquer Troy, which he did. And so Arthur said, why don't you come back with me and conquer Columbia? That was a very moving moment in my life and began to change my mind in terms of what I wanted to do. Immediately, I spoke to Sue about it, and she was also encouraging. My parents, on the other hand, were not encouraging at all. In fact, they were violently opposed to my returning to Manhattan. They were, had a rock solid conviction that were I to go back, I would get killed by a bus or fall into a manhole. And it just couldn't happen, at least on their watch. So I made a decision 
that if I were to stay in Buffalo, the options that my that the social workers gave me were to make screwdrivers, cane chairs, or serve as a justice of the peace. And one of the social workers suggested we go to Batavia, New York, to visit some blind justices of the peace. And when Sue and I got there, what we saw were people who had had the life sucked out of them. Their earnings were meager at best, and their future was, in my opinion, non-existent. And I couldn't tolerate the thought of my doing that for the rest of my life. And so I decided to go back and Arthur, as he had promised, was enormously helpful to me. He would read to me regularly, aside from taking me around the city. And he would come into the room and say, Sanford, darkness is going to read to you now. Darkness is going to read from the Iliad, or darkness is going to read from the New York Times. And so, I suppose he meant that for him, his voice was emerging from the darkness. And I called him darkness because that's what he called himself. And it was a very fitting name given his perspective. And hence the name of the book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. But to answer your question directly, it happened to be the people who cared a great deal about me and for whom I cared a great deal that made it possible for me even to think about returning and then to go beyond that. And you really did go way, way beyond just finishing your undergraduate degree at Columbia University. Uh, I, I, the book is dedicated, and I'll read it, for Sue, the one who has always been there. One of the things I really loved about the book, Sandy, was this love story that you and Sue have had over all of these years. And I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that before we move on to some of the other major points in the book. It, it, it really was so compelling to learn about this, this great love story. She was from Buffalo. You're from Buffalo. You met there, uh, and you went through this situation. And, uh, you know, you're still obviously together and you still love each other so much. Yes. In sixth grade, we had just moved to a new part of Buffalo. Um, and I entered public school 66. And I looked across the room and I saw a girl in the process of becoming a woman that simply was stunning. I could not get my eyes off of her, but she never spoke to me. She didn't speak to me in sixth grade or in seventh grade or in eighth grade. And I followed her when she was walking with her friends, when she was riding her bicycle. But no talk until the eighth grade when the Buffalo Evening News had a spelling contest. And she and I were the two finalists. And the word to be spelled in the final round was silhouette. I spelled it correctly. And that was a big fearful decision for me because that might have antagonized her and I certainly didn't want that. She didn't spell it correctly. Uh, despite that, she at least recognized that I was someone to be talked to. And by the time high school came around, she accepted a, 
offer of a date to go to the annual cancer charity ball. And from that moment on until this very moment, she has been the love of my life, the joy of my life. Never gave up on me for one minute, and nor did I give up on her for one minute because she had her own trials. It's a really, really powerful love story. And it's one of the really, there's so many great things in this book. Hello, darkness, my old friend. But uh, that love story is so, so compelling. And, and you explained it beautifully just now. You are blessed to have Sue with you all of these many, many years. And you've gone through, obviously, so much. What was it like, Sandy, uh, coming out of surgery and being told you're going to be blind for the rest of your life? It was frightening, but my thoughts were not about my condition. What pained me the most was the fact that my mother who was sitting at the front of the hospital bed I was in, watched her eldest son go blind, his eyes cut open right in front of her. I could not tolerate that pain. Couldn't then and can't now. She sacrificed her life for her four children. And the greatest burden she had came from me. And that is hard to live with. A few days into my stay, I was exceedingly frustrated, but I awoke and I made a promise to God. I said, God, if I ever recover from my current circumstance, I will do everything I can to make sure no one else goes blind. It was naive, it was adolescent, it was irrational. But that is the promise I made. And in my world, if you made a promise, you kept it. It's what we all learned in Buffalo. How did you manage to A, go back to Columbia University, get your degree and do really well, and then go on not only as a blind man, but then go on to Harvard and Oxford, get additional degrees and so many additional honors. How did you do that without being able to see uh, and actually you know, deal with, uh, with what you know, obviously students normally just take for granted their ability to see and read and all of that? How did you do it? I guess in the first instance, I had an insatiable appetite to learn. Ideas drove me. And as I say in the book, the two most important things in the world are people and ideas. And I was blessed to have so many people who volunteered to read to me at all three universities I attended. That made the difference. I had a tape recorder so I could tape my lectures and also books. And the faculty 
the faculty of all three, except for one, encouraged me and provided uh, assistance, not specifically, but they made it clear to me that anytime I wanted to talk with them, I was free to do so, whether it was about the substance of lectures or any personal issues. But there was one professor who, when I first returned, we walked outside and we sat on a bench at the Columbia campus. And he said, uh, Sanford, I think your career is over. You will not be able to make it as a blind man. Columbia is not for you. He was a classicist and respected around campus as being one of the wisest people on campus. So his words carried a great deal of weight. I went back to my room and I thought about what he said. And yet what was in me was the, the need to go forward and study and learn and build myself back into a respectable human being. Because when you're blind, among other things, you lose your dignity, or at least that's my particular view. And so everything I did, as I say in the book, were additions. There were plenty of subtractions in my life, but blindness being the largest subtraction. So you keep building and building and building in the hope that you will be able to accomplish what you set out to do. And my first goal was to educate myself. I reasoned that if I couldn't see, at least I had my memory. And so I decided to gain an understanding in business and government and finance and law. And those studies stood me in very good stead as the decades rolled on. In fact, they were essential to what I was able to do. And, and, and as I say, you write so beautifully about all of that in this really amazing book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. Talk a little bit more, if you don't mind, Sandy, about this really wonderful friendship you had with Art Garfunkel, who, of course, all of us know is part of the group Simon and Garfunkel with Paul Simon later becoming such successful, you know, uh, mu musical talent out there. But uh, long before he became very successful, he was so successful in helping you, his best friend. Yeah. I met him freshman orientation week. And shortly thereafter, we became very good friends. One day, after humanities class, we walked outside and he called me over to look at this patch of grass. And he said, Sanford, I want you to look at this patch of grass, really look at it. He said, see how the light illuminates the beauty and complexities of its colors. And I shook my head and said, can this be true? All of my other friends, they were jocks or eggheads or just plain old students. And the conversation happened to be about women or politics or 
occasionally studies. Uh, but that insight, that moment in time, I was a 17-year-old kid from Buffalo, New York, who had not traveled outside the city. And here I was exposed to someone who believed. in the beauty of nature. And that one moment transmogrified my life. I looked at nature differently and I experienced life differently. And that opened up this friendship of ours, which has lasted all these 60 some years. It's really a blessing that he, you had him as your best friend at Columbia. And you got your degree at Columbia, Phi Beta Kappa. And I'm looking at my notes. You were class president, went on to study law, receive a PhD from Harvard, an MBA, then later from Columbia, a Marshall Scholarship to Oxford, a White House Fellowship. All of this basically happening after you became blind, right? Yes, sir. It's really an amazing story, Sandy, that, uh, you know, once you start reading this fabulous book, you can't put it down because it is so, so compelling. Uh, and you then became very successful in business and on boards and doing all sorts of terrific things. But you've dedicated a big chunk of your life right now to helping deal with this issue of blindness. And you would like to cure blindness. How is that going right now? Well, as I mentioned, the promise I made to God was in 1961, when science was nowhere near able to deal with the notion that we could end blindness, let alone end many other diseases. But I had promised, and so decade after decade after decade, I followed the science to see if enough progress had been made so that we might take a shot at claiming to the world that now it's time to end blindness. And it was only in the beginning of this century that I sensed that it might be time to begin thinking about that in earnest. In 2010, I was asked to be chairman of the Board of Governors of the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins. And with the director of the Wilmer Eye Institute, a man named Peter McDonald, I explained my thinking about ending blindness. And he has supported me and been with me as a partner ever since. And we decided, Sue and I, in 2012 to create a prize to be given to the most brilliant members of this generation who have done the most to end blindness. And we awarded the prizes to 13 exceedingly distinguished scientists in December of 2020. But that was the beginning. And subsequent to that, Johns Hopkins and the Wilmer Eye Institute have created the Sanford and Susan Greenberg Center to End Blindness at Wilmer. It's the only facility in the world devoted solely to ending blindness for everyone forevermore. You know, blindness, I think, is the oldest cruelty. It, it's really a subversion of the creator's intent. And it's been with us for six million years. And the billions of people 
who've been affected has caused humanity to lose other Churchills and Gandhis and Mother Teresas. Now, there has been progress. Louis Braille came along and made a significant contribution. Much of the technology that's around, including, I'm pleased to say, my compressed speech machine, have been very helpful to blind people. The problem is that 70% of blind Americans are unemployed. That, that's a staggering number. So while these pieces of equipment can elevate the lifestyle of a blind person, doesn't help them get a job. So I believe there is no other choice but to end this ancient scourge. And fortunately, in the last number of years, we have garnered incredible support for scientists all over the world. And we are in the process of putting together $100 million, of which we're two thirds there, to continue this so that within the next period of time, after these six million years, we will end blindness. And, you know, in one of the final chapter, I think the final chapter in the book, uh, you have a chapter entitled To End Blindness Forever. And I underlined uh, a, a sentence that you end that chapter with. Let me read it to you now, Sandy. I may not be around to witness it, but before this century is out, blindness will disappear from the long roster of human injustices. And this too will be a giant leap for mankind. So you see progress unfolding right now at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere in, in trying to end blindness forever. Is that right? Yes, sir, I do. That would be so, so critically important if that happens. I know you've dedicated you know, your efforts, financial and otherwise, to deal with this uh, critically important issue right now. But do you see uh, a commitment on the part of everyone else to follow your lead right now? Yes, I, we have great support from every sector of human endeavor that has come to help. We, in order to select the prize, we had a scientific advisory board, which um, had three Nobel laureates on the, uh, on the board. We had a national governing council in which we had many, many civic leaders uh, on the board. Uh, including, of course, my friends Art Garfunkel and Jerry Speyer, Mike Bloomberg, Senator Dole. Uh, we've had uh, incredible uh, responsiveness from sectors of the, the economy of the world that I could not have imagined. Uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder and head of the World Economic Forum, put it on the agenda of uh, Davos and for three years. And the uh, attention that that garnered in different parts of the world, of finance in particular, was very important because those are the people who support the research. And what you're doing now, Sandy, is so, so important. If there are people who are watching us right now who want to get involved and help. I know you have uh, uh, some ideas on how what they can do right now, and I wonder if you want to share some thoughts on how folks out there who might be able to help you and others deal with this issue of blindness, what they should do. Thanks, Wolf. Well, if they're interested, uh, the easiest way without getting into complexity is to uh, write me at uh, sanfordgreenberg.com 
uh, that that'll make it much simpler and I can communicate directly with the people interested in, in supporting this effort. It, it really is so, so critically important. And it's so, it, it feels like it's so doable right now to, to deal with this issue. Uh, and I wanna thank you and thank everybody at the Greenberg Center for doing what you're doing right now because it's gonna help millions and millions of people out there deal with this issue. You've dealt with it uh, and you you have a firsthand experience in dealing with it. So it's so critically important. And I'm really happy to hear that all these prominent people out there are involved and they're helping you not only in Davos at the World Economic Forum, but all over the country right now. Indeed, all over the world, people are getting involved and appreciating how significant this is. And if Hello Darkness, my old friend, your new book, uh, if it has that impact, in, in convincing folks that there's stuff to, to be done, it will be so, so critically important. Uh, I just wanna go back a little bit in time, Sandy. Like, like you know, as I said, both of us grew up in Buffalo, New York. Uh, we have similar roots, you know, Jewish family, uh, our Jewish roots, well-known. You lived on Saranac uh, when you were growing up. You went to school 66. When I was in kindergarten first and First grade, I went to school 81, which is not too far away. Right. Uh, and we lived on Hartwell Road in North, North Buffalo. You were in North Buffalo. But when you moved to Saranac, uh, which I remember that street, uh, you thought that was a big deal. That was like uh, the, the high end. <laughs> when I look back on Saranac, which is you know, not very far away from, from a Hartwell Road, I'm saying to myself, that was not exactly a, a wealthy part of you know, the city of Buffalo. By the way, Sue grew up in Hartwell. She did? Yeah. What number? Do you remember what number street? I think it was three. I was at 302. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. What a small world. Yeah. Then we moved to Kenmore. And that's where I really grew up in Kenmore. And, and went to Kenmore Junior High and Kenmore West Senior High. Uh, and so that, I mean, it was just, you know, a few blocks away. But it was in one of the little suburbs of Buffalo. It was definitely beyond our reach. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was, uh, talk a little bit about how your Jewish roots, and, and this is an event that's being sponsored by the 92nd Street Y. Talk a little bit about your Jewish roots and how that has impacted you over all of these years, Sandy. Well, uh, I was born and raised uh, in an Orthodox Jewish family. And um, prior to the golden era of Saranac Avenue, we lived in a shtetl-like part of the city uh, and between Broadway and uh, William on Hickory Street. And The people were extremely close and it all revolved around religion and, and the faith of these people. I don't have to tell you of all people about the remainder of the conversations in the late forties about the Holocaust. I grew up listening to stories about that because some of my family members had been decimated by the Nazis. It made us or at least I felt proud to be part of a heritage that lasted for thousands of years and that the tenets that we were taught growing up were moral guidelines that I found very much to my liking and very important. Now, I will say this, that I know that Maimonides 
talked about having faith without wavering. I can't go that far. There were moments in my life, particularly after I lost my eyesight, where I dug down deeply into my being to try and figure out if there was any meaning to what had happened to me. But in the end, I still believe in the Almighty and since I made this promise to him, I will spend the remainder of my life trying to fulfill it. You know, in, in reading the book, Sandy, you mentioned a Hebrew phrase several times, and I want you to explain to folks who are watching right now what this means and what it means specifically to you. The Hebrew phrase you write about is called tikkun olam. Tell us about that. Tikkun Olam is a Jewish philosophical view of the world, which is to say that each of us is obligated to do what they can to repair the world or to try and perfect it, which of course is impossible. But that's, that's a goal of Tikkun Olam. And I created my own tikkun olam, my way of trying to repair parts of the world that are suffering immeasurably. But I think it's open to everyone. Tikkun olam is a phrase that could be, should be shared by every person, every religion, because I think it is, uh, an, ele elevates human beings to look beyond their own daily needs and to recognize that we have this extraordinary universe that needs tending to. So, so important. Uh, and the Hebrew words tikkun, as you correctly point out, obviously, is to fix or repair. Olam means world, the world, to fix or repair the world, which is what you are clearly trying to do. And, and I've got some notes here. President Clinton appointed you to the National Science Board. You served as chairman of the Rural Health Care Co Cooperation. You were director of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. You were a founding director of the American Agenda, an organization established by Presidents Carter and Ford to identify the six most urgent problems confronting the nation and to recommend bipartisan solutions. And you did all this as somebody who had lost your, your sight. All of these amazing things you have done. You are such an inspiration to folks out there, Sandy. And, and I wonder if you want to give us what you hope will be uh, the major takeaways, the ma major lessons learned by folks who read Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. Well, first of all, I have to say, Wolf, that in the past half century or so, your contribution to society, to repairing the world, what you've done for people who love freedom around the world is so significant and has elevated the conversation, the national conversation, the international conversation about the most difficult issues humanity has to face. So uh, as a citizen, uh, I want to thank you for doing that. As to uh, your question about I guess your question is, well, what 
could people take away from the book? Is that what you hope people take away from after they read this really amazing book, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend? What do you hope they emerge with and they learn from a, a major takeaway? Uh, there's so many lessons I've learned from reading it. And it's, it's really, uh, you know, one of the best I've read and, and so emotional and so powerful. Well, Einstein said it best to me, and this goes back to when Arthur first introduced me to that patch of grass. Einstein said the, the most beautiful experience in the world is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and science. Whoever does not know it can no longer wonder, can no longer marvel, is as good as dead and his eyes are dim. And what I hope people will come away from after reading the book is to appreciate the magic of daily living. The magnificent gargantuan essence, the joy and the beauty that each of us can uncover on a daily basis. On a day when you're walking with a loved one, or any ordinary day, I stand on the banks of the Potomac. waiting for something extraordinary to happen. And it always does. Do you have any specific advice, Sandy, for people who are going blind out there who may be listening and watching us right now? Yeah, I think I do, but it doesn't come from me. It comes from Beethoven. Uh, Beethoven, when he was, I think, 28 years old, wrote a letter to his two brothers in which he told the story of his standing next to a man who heard a person playing a flute about 20 feet away. And Beethoven, of course, could not hear the music. And he wrote that another incident like that, and I will end my life. And then he thought about it and said, but I have much art to give forth to the world. And so I endured this wretched existence, truly wretched. Now, I don't want to say that everybody who has problems lives a wretched life. Let's call it a difficult life. I think if you can find something that is a dream that's so big that you can commit to it, that you love it, that you care for it, and you devote yourself to it your entire life your troubles will be far less significant. Truly, truly powerful words. And, and, and I just want to point out that uh, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend, your amazing and wonderful new book, really has lessons for all of us. Uh, it, it, it tells your story uh, on so many different levels, but it also tells the story of so many people out there who, who are going through you know, really uh, rather difficult circumstances and how to deal and how to cope and how to learn and overcome, you know, these circumstances and move on, which is exactly what you have done. And I congratulate you, Sandy, uh, for doing what you're doing. And, and on behalf of everyone who are watching us right now and all the people who uh, will read Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. And, you know, Art Garfunkel was your roommate 
uh, and you tell some interesting stories about, and very briefly, I just want to wrap it up with uh, music. You know, he was a, a, he still is a very talented uh, musical entertainer, but you played the trumpet and the drums, didn't you? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Well, I, I played the trumpet on Saranac Avenue in the basement. And as my next door neighbor said to me once, you know, Sandy, you ain't no Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, uh, I couldn't take the trumpet to college, so I took my drums with me. And uh, many nights after Arthur and I finished studying, he would get out his guitar, I would get out my drums, and we'd um, play. I was a D DJ, and uh, we recorded songs that we sang together in the late 50s. And um, I still have those tapes. In fact, for a large, uh, 60th birthday of Arthur, I didn't know what to get him. So <laughs> I... I uh, recorded the uh, from from the reel to reel tape that I was using I converted it to a cassette tape and presented it to him which is a treasure of his and of course a treasure of mine so what you're saying Sandy is before there was Simon and Garfunkel there was Greenberg and Garfunkel is that what you're saying I'm saying exactly that in fact the label of the uh, record I gave him was Sanford and Greenberg so there was no mistake in mistake, mistaking the S and G. Yep. Uh, you tell these beautiful stories in this book. I highly, highly recommend it. And I hope uh, it becomes a number one New York Times bestseller as it deserves to be. Uh, and I, I think I want to just thank you, uh, Sandy, for doing what you've done. You're going to help a lot of wonderful people out there get through some really difficult circumstances if they can just read or somebody can read to them this really amazing book. Uh, I'm so proud of you as a fellow Buffalonian, so proud of you in so many respects. And so let me just thank you on behalf of all of our viewers out there who are watching and listening. Thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you for continuing your effort to cure blindness. I hope, I hope it happens and I hope it happens soon. And if it does happen, we will all be able to thank you for the contributions that you have made. I'll give you one, uh, Final question, is there anything you want to wrap this conversation up with? Any final thought? My final thoughts, uh, I suppose that uh, my, my dream is to summarize it, is to see that all God's children over time will not only feel the sun shining on their face, but be able to witness it with their own two eyes, to witness its rising and its setting. And then, and then, I believe creation will be made whole. All right. Once again, the book is entitled, Hello, Darkness, My Old Friend. Here it is. The subtitle, How Daring Dreams an unyielding friendship turned one man's blindness into an extraordinary vision for life. Sanford D. Greenberg is the author. Introduction by Art Garfunkel. Forward by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Final word by Margaret Atwood. Sandy, thank you so much for all you have done. Thank you so much for all you're doing. And let's, let's thank the 92nd Street Y for making this conversation possible. We are grateful to you. Well, I am very grateful to you, Will, for taking the time, for reading the book, and for appearing. This was very, very nice of you. And I also thank the 92nd Street Y for making the venue possible. Thank you. All right. Keep up the great work. We will stay in close touch. Uh, and uh, let's hope for the best. You bet. Uh,